dar la bienvenida a un profesor ilustre que entre los traumatólogos solo os diré que lo tenemos valorado como el número uno del mundo. For us, number one, number one of the world in biomechanics. ¿Por qué digo esto? Digo esto porque no lo digo yo, sino que lo dice la trayectoria suya. Hombre que hoy en día en internet solo poner sabio Wu, veréis la cantidad de estudios científicos que tiene. Y realmente lo que ha aportado a la ciencia a nivel mundial, sobre todo en biomecánica. Curiosamente, esta mañana estábamos hablando de factores, pero si él ha sido un pionero del de uso de los factores de crecimiento en Estados Unidos. De aquí, que es un hombre que le gusta y le ha gustado mucho venir a Valencia y mañana trasladarnos a Córdoba para otra lectura de tesis ¿por qué? porque le encanta la ciencia le encanta el estudio a nivel molecular a nivel biológico de lo que son los factores de crecimiento y creo que como yo digo siempre cuando este hombre habla las moscas se oyen hay que escucharle y hay que procurar que se os quede, sobre todo, gente joven, gente de futuro, que se os quede y que no os caiga ninguna frase fuera de, esto, de vuestro cerebro. Vale la pena que escuchéis con atención, ya veréis una trayectoria de trabajo, cómo se trabaja y cómo realmente uno se puede hacer un lugar en el mundo científico. Ni más ni menos, ya sabéis, profesor, eh, mérito, eh, yo creo que ha estado en todas las sociedades mundiales, ha ayudado a todo el mundo y darle las gracias porque cuando Monse le hizo la invitación para venir a estar ayer, hoy aquí y luego en Córdoba, insofacto dijo que allí estaremos tanto él como Patti, que es su señora. ¿Eh? Por lo tanto, gracias, bienvenido a Valencia, bienvenido a España y, as you like, you can start. Thank you, Sabio, for estar aquí, for to be here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ramon. I... Uh, thanks to Nacho, I get a little bit idea of what you said. Uh, I'm not near as good as you say, but uh, I will try. <laughs> but it sounded very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Gracias. Uh, First, I want to congratulate Elena for uh, completing uh, successfully your doctoral examination. So congratulations and compliment. Uh, I, uh, when Monse asked me to come uh, to, to Spain, I, I say yes because I love Spain. Uh, and so, so it didn't take much uh, enticement very easy to, to come. Um, I, I want to uh, give a little bit of history. Uh, Monse and Ramon came to Pittsburgh uh, probably around year 2000. Uh, we were early in the morning uh, trying to watch the Pittsburgh Marathon together. And as she, the middle young lady is my daughter. She's uh, in medical school at that time. And you can see I already love Monse because I always stand next to Monse when I take pictures. <laughs> yeah. 
So Ramon has to be in the back. Yes. Uh, yes. And then, uh, of course, uh, a couple of years ago, 2009, I was invited uh, to uh, the foundation meeting in Barcelona. And uh, you can see I'm always next to Monsi uh, whenever we are pictured together. And of course, uh, uh, we went to Isako's meeting uh, in Japan. And again, you can see that Monse is always next to me. So when Monse asks me to do something, I don't question, I just do. Okay. So now to pick a topic to speak here, and uh, it is not so easy, but because uh, I don't know, so I asked what would be a good subject, and uh, this was the topic was chosen that tell a little story about uh, how in five decades, 50 uh, years, that I've conducted uh, research with my, my students, my fellows, my residents, and my colleagues. So I want to tell you how, a little bit of kind of like a story uh, to, to, to share with you. Uh, in the 1970s, when I started at University of California, I, as a young faculty, I, I learned, uh, I have to learn orthopedics very quickly because I was, my doctoral work was on the eyeball, on the eye, ophthalmology. So, first thing I, I learned was that why are orthopedic surgeons put so much plastic cast immobilizing joints at that time? And uh, I, I didn't like the immobilization, I feel that we have joints that are made to move, and why are we immobilizing them all the time? And I discovered they were treating MCL tears with big long leg casts for six weeks to nine weeks. And I thought, this remind me when I was in third grade, uh, I, I, was not, uh, I was not such a good student, I was a little bit naughty, I wanted to play. Uh, Sometimes uh, the teacher did not like what I do. And then she would penalize the whole class. And I said, that's not quite right. I'm the one being bad, but why is everybody being penalized? So immobilize the joint remind me of the same story. If you damage your MCL, why are you penalized the entire knee? So, this was the stimulus of me thinking that something must be done differently. And then in the 80s, I went into uh, functional treatment, look at how you treat ligaments without injury, without surgery. In the 90s, I uh, got very interested in ACL reconstruction because after I learned more from the medial collateral ligament, I think I understand the ligament enough after 20 years that I can tackle a little more complicated ligament, uh, such as the anterior cruciate ligament. Then in the year 2000, late 90, 1990s, I got interested in growth factors, and I thought, oh, maybe there are ways that we can uh, accelerate the healing a little bit better and make it better tissue. I, I never thought about, uh, even though we use the word tissue regeneration, I'm, I don't believe it because I think we can fool the mother nature just a little bit, not too much. If you set your size too high, you will fall, you will never reach. And finally, I want to do a little bit better in getting tissue to heal faster, better by using different approaches. And so the, in, in these starting last uh, few years, I start thinking about using other ways to to uh, uh, do things that what I've been doing, I'll share that with you. And finally, it really is we need to think more about injury prevention is something that I think we pay attention to. So let me first give you this life story, if you will. You know, if we take the dog knee or the rabbit knee, immobilize it for something like six to nine weeks, you can dissect the whole more muscle, everything, where well, all you got is some capsule, and you can hang a kilogram weight, and the joint will not open. And we all know that it's a contracture formation. And uh, 
joint is stiff. If you measure mechanically how much torque it takes to open, close the joint, that's kind of a, the top graph is the normal joint, very smooth, doesn't take much force. The bottom joint is after you immobilize. <coughs> you can see the big, <coughs> very different. Uh, this you all experience. And uh, you have uh, uh, cross-linked the form. We discovered that actually the reason why joint doesn't open is the posterior capsule. The collagen uh, stick together by little new collagen formation. It's like you take a chain link fence, if you, they slide very easily, but if you just fuse it a couple of places, the fence no longer can slide. And then you have pannus formation, of course, and then eventually to cartilage degeneration by immobilization. So if you take the knee, medial clavicle ligament, because I like the MCL, it's a nice, for engineer, we like nice and straight tissue. Uh, in most animals, the MCL is quite nice, and we can do tensile testing, very, so you design some special gadget, you can do proper testing with ligaments very short. And you can see the yellow line <coughs> on the low elongation curve, stretching. Uh, control is quite stiff and strong, but as you immobilize, you can see the tissue become uh, very weak and the stiffness is reduced, so big difference. So you may want to question that, well, the joint is stiff and tissue is weak, so it's a double penalty. Not only does you have a stiff joint, but the ligaments become weaker now. And the weakness came mainly, not so much as the, as the ligament, of course, weak in itself, but the weakest part came from the insertion. The, the blue is the ligament, it attached to the bone, it's red. You can see that there's a lot of osteoclastic activity <coughs> in the attachment. So what happens is if you immobilize, immobilize the joint because of the lack of stress, or actually this happens the same if you injure the ligament, because the lack of stress on the insertion side, the osteoclast comes in to clip the attachment away. And this is actually a very difficult thing to recover. And you can see, if you look at immobilization, the tensile property or tissue mass reduced, but recovery in, in several weeks, but recovery takes many, many months, even years. So you have to think about this is not a one-to-one -one phenomenon. You know, once you destroy the insertion site attachment, it's very difficult for the body to re-establish the attachment. It takes many, many months to do that. So I developed this kind of a homeostasis curve of when you think about ligaments. It's like a normal activity will be in the yellow zone. You know, some of us are more active than the other. And I've done some study on the exercise effect of ligaments. You have some gain, but the gain is very small. Okay, but on the other hand, if you immobilize the red zone, the penalty is huge. So you cannot think of this as a one straight line. It's like a highly nonlinear phenomena of homeostasis. So you just have to remember that. That's why we don't immobilize. And also, if you repair injury, injury ligament. It's not so simple like a remodeling. It takes a long time for it to do so. So what did we do? We did change some paradigm of clinical management because in the 70s, early 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, most orthopedic surgeons do not appreciate that ligaments are alive, especially if you're a total joint surgeon. They never see a ligament they like, they always cut it so they put their artificial joint. And it's actually give us an idea that it, ligaments are alive and it undergo very rapid homeostasis. And then, no, and then I think because of our type of work, it has changed the thinking that we maybe not want to immobilize the whole joint. Uh, it, 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 it is a very effective uh, scientific study. And 
Of course, at that time, I advocated that control motion is good. Since joints are made to move, even if it's injured, we still should think about how can we control motion. You know, you don't want to damage the ligament that is already in the healing process, but you can make the other part of the joint move. So it's just how you need to move. <coughs> because joint is a six degree of freedom, we can move, you know, not one degree, but maybe other degrees of freedom we can move. And then you can see that my two of my very best friends, they also started at that time uh, in the 80s, that their own uh, institute, their, their motto is a statement which they keep people active, it's moving. Uh, and Professor Shiruri in Perugia, let people move. So the word move is important, you know, it's in there. And then, of course, even Mrs. Obama in uh, a couple years ago, let's move. So it's always about move. So. Now, now let's go to the next decade. How, you want to move, but how do you move? How do you treat it? So we said, okay, but before we start doing anything, we must, must understand what the normal ligament does. What is it, you know? So we did many basic science studies. We look at biological factors, look at the anatomy, morphology, collagen, how it's cross-link, and tissue development, uh, aging and remodeling, all the normal stuff. And then we also develop some mathematical theory to describe the biomechanical behavior. So in this decade, many of my students, resident fellows, did a lot of work. All the fundamental work, because if you don't know the fundamental, what the normal looks like, you cannot take care of the abnormal. And we also look at experimental factors, because ligaments are very, very difficult to test. So we have to develop many new methodologies if you have the wrong methodology, you get the wrong answer. So we look at the effect of temperature. As you know, uh, Valencia is very warm, our skin is very soft, but if you go to Alaska, your skin is very hard. The same skin. It's just the temperature can affect the property of the tissue. And then storage, can, most of the time we cannot test the specimen fresh, we store them and then we don't want to destroy the specimen. So proper storage, uh, rate of loading, uh, specimen orientation, very short tissue, structural mechanical property and the function. All these things can affect the results. So I advise you, when you look at the biomechanics of ligament, you always should question, is this test done correctly? Okay, because if you've done the test incorrectly, you definitely will get the wrong answer. So all these data on the biology, biomechanics, biochemistry, now we have in this decade that we've done, we can use it to evaluate anything that about healing, repair, and so on. So for, I'll give you an example. Uh, took us many years to develop a model that we can rupture and medial collateral ligament of the rabbit, like this. So it looks more like a normal ligament injury, uh, as you see in the operator, we can rupture. And then, very interestingly, we find that with such a big rupture ligament, within 10 days, if you look at the histology, there's already continuity. It heals within 10 days, they connect. And then, but if you look at the attachment side on the right panel, that brick ligament is very, very disrupted. So even though if you, if you just say, look at, oh, or MRI, you say, oh, it looks healed already. You know, it's connected. But the insertion site is not greatly damaged. So you have to be very careful that when you have this kind of uh, ligament tear. So basically, we discovered that, you know, the days are, of inflammatory response, weeks, of restorative phase, and then months of remodeling phase, basically. But interestingly, if you do tensile tests, six weeks in the red line, that's what it looks like, compared to the light blue line, the normal. By 12 weeks, we are doing pretty well, right, mechanically. 
structurally did very well, and not much change from 12 weeks to one year for a ligament torn like this. So functionally, you would say to your patient, between six and 12 weeks, they do very well. This is in the rabbit, we didn't do anything, all we do is rupture it and close it, and then this is what happened. So at that time, with this kind of data we published, of course we publish a lot more, then we have tell our clinical colleague that basic science has discovered that MCL can heal spontaneously and successfully. A really a big rupture MCL can heal by itself. Okay. This is very different from other extra-articular ligament, intra-articular ligament, tendon, they are very, very different. So, just a few years later, then people like Canis and Indelicato from Florida, they eventually also find that they can start treating their patient uh, without surgery and get a pretty function, good function ACL, uh, MCL in follow MCL injury. So they, they look at the basic sign, they try it in the clinical, and it works for them. But if you have a question of combined ACL and MCL injury, then we also discover in animal study that if you can reconstruct the ACL in animals, you get a pretty good healing MCL. You don't need to do both. So this is kind of thing is developed that we really basically change from surgery treatment to functional management. So this is where the basic science research have a direct impact to the clinical practice. Okay, now I move on to how to re improve ACL reconstruction because everybody was at that time in the 1980s asked me, what should we do with ACL? I said, I don't know anything about ACL. I don't know enough. I cannot tell you. But even if I do, I do, I won't tell you. Because I don't see the patient. So I said, but I will now try to do some research in animals. And at least in cadaver. So I can do. But because ACL injury occurs so often and so devastating, like this person is doing this, this lady does catching the basketball like this million times, but just that time it's happened. So it's a very tricky thing to look at what exactly is going on with ACL injury. So I wanted to study ACL, but I find that the knee is very, very complex. I cannot reproduce the motion. If I damage the ACL on the knee, I, I lost the motion. I cannot reproduce it. So I said, okay, I've been looking for a robot for a long time. Robot is a very good device because it can reproduce motion with high fidelity. Okay. They can repeat the motion. And, but the robot is pretty stupid. So you need a little brain. We add what we call UFS, is force moment sensor would determine how much force you want in what direction. So with, the, with this robot UFS testing system, we can operate in force control, position control, or hybrid control. And we can control the motion and control the loading on the knee. Okay, now what does it mean? Well, let's say if I take a cadaver, cadaver human <coughs> cadaver knee, I say, I'm going to do a flexion excision test just like Dr. Bugatti. Look at the patient. He goes from the extension. <coughs> Dr. Bugatti did the, did the flexion exam, but he, he cannot find if repeated. But I say, okay, now I record all the motion in three dimensional space. I did that now. I did the path. And then what I did was I said, I show you I can do it again. I cut everything away from the knee. And I asked the robot, please reproduce the same motion as in the last video. And I can do that. I can go from flexion to extension, back to flexion. 
Okay. So just to show you that we really have nothing in contact, but I can still reproduce the motion. Now, that's very important because if you can reproduce the motion, then you can do something. You record the positions at 30, 90, whatever angle you choose. Then you can apply some load to the knee, and you can go from point B, go from point A to point B, and not only record the point A to point B, but the exact path from point A to point B. Now, when you can do that, there's an engineering principle called principle of superposition. So the nice thing is that I take the normal knee, I hit the motion, and I apply a load to it, and then I record the motion. Then I cut the AC up. Then I ask the knee to reproduce the same motion. Of course, the knee with the ACL, without the ACL, the forces would be different, right? Well, the different the force, because they have the same motion, is the force the ACL. So this is the correct way to find what is the ACL. Now, the nice thing about a robot is that after I did the ACL, I can do the MCL, I can do the PCL, I can do the posterior lateral corner, I can do the meniscus, I can find everything for one particular loading condition. Okay? And you can apply any loading condition you want. So you can do pivot shift test, you can do that. So major advantage is that <clears throat> the knee kinematic and the forces in the ligament can be obtained. And they are all obtained by the same specimen. The biggest problem is your knee and my knee we have very different data. So if you can get the data from the same knee, then it's very powerful because you can use all the interspecimen variations now eliminated. And my data can be analyzed using repeated and over. Okay, this is why this is a very powerful effort. And then now probably, I would say, 20 or more laboratories around the world has this device now. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> you look at that time, of course, uh, in the 90s, everybody was thinking about uh, double bundle. <clears throat> so we did this first study, wanted to examine what are the difference between anterior medial bundle and posterior lateral bundle, ACL. And uh, we find the complex function. If you just do an anterior tibial draw test, you will find the, in the flexion, to ex in an extension to flexion, you find that in a knee extension, the posterior lateral bundle is very, very, takes a lot of load, the green line. But once the knee is flexed past 30, the posterior lateral bundle almost does nothing, whereas the anterior medial bundle takes over. So it tells us a little bit about when the very simple loading of the knee, what is the function of the anterior medial bundle from posterior bundle. So if you know that, then you ought to reproduce in your reconstruction. So another thing we find that if you apply rotatory combined valves and internal load, it's a little bit like pivot shift test. If you're doing a simulated pivot shift test, loading the knee like that, turns out the knee actually moves anterior. So even though you apply rotatory load to the knee, the knee moves anterior. So that tells you the complexity is not just you say, I apply force this direction, the knee moves that way. If you apply forces this direction, the knee may move the other way. Oh, so this is the kind of data that, that we can obtain. So with this device, we did a lot of things. We look at, maybe look at different graph choices. We can compare them, patella tendon versus hamstring. Where do you put the tunnel? How do you tension the graph? Where angles you fix the graph, what is the graph tunnel motion, how does the graph heal with time, we can all do that with this device. And what happened is that we actually published 75 papers using this device, looking at all the things about ACL reconstruction, ACL uh, function. And what it is is that our hope is to create a reconstruction that will close, be closer to the normal. <clears throat> so it was a lot of work for 10 years and a lot of data out there about this ACL and ACL function, ACL reconstruction.
Now, a little example, where do you put, put the tunnel? Uh, you know, at first we look at the 10 o'clock. There was a time because of convenience, people were putting the tunnel right at 12 o'clock position because you can one shot go from the tibia and up. It turns out it's not very good for the knee because the, the femoral tunnel is the most important. And it's right in the center, it has no rotatory control. So people say, well, I put mine in 11 o'clock, which is about uh, 11 o'clock by the clock. And some say I put it 10 o'clock. And basically we said, no, you need to really consider whether you're putting in the anterior medial part or posterior part. Maybe that's closer to 10, 11, but you have to consider the sagittal plane too, not just the frontal plane. And uh, then a question about why well, is double bundle better than if I put the graph in the anterior medial bundle position? And we did a study, same thing, again, use the same knee, two kinds of reconstruction. We find that when you apply rotatory loads to the knee, uh, if you put the graph in the AM bundle position, it's a little bit unsatisfactory, both in terms of anterior tibial translation and forces in the graph, the purple dots results. But if you put a double bundle, both, you get closer to the satisfactory or normal data. So these kind of things we can tell you in the laboratory study. So what do we do? Well, we find out that ACL graph is probably insufficient the way it, was be, it has been done in response to auditory low. And if you, are, you know your orthopedic surgeon friends, they now all put their graph more lateral. Everybody stopped putting more lateral. Nobody put it straight up or in the just anterior middle bundle. And then we, you know, really it's going from more like from anterior medial insertion to posterolateral bundle insertion. Now, everybody is doing that now. And then we find the double bundle does have some biomechanical advantages immediately post up. Long term, probably I don't know because now the data come up, clinical data, is that they are not much different. At least they could not prove they're different. But the important thing is we feel that if you just put the graph to it in the posterior lateral bundle, you can actually get pretty good results biomechanically up to 60 degrees of flexion. But who needs the ACL when your knee flexes at 60 and pass? Because the quadricep and hamstring will take over. Now I go to something that maybe you are more familiar with, on the tissue, how using the biological augmentation. Now, tissue engineering and tissue regeneration is very, very popular. You know, there's not a month or two weeks go by without a major international meeting these days. And, uh, but I want to give you <coughs> a little history about tissue engineering. How the word tissue engineering came about. It actually was in 1987, my mentor at University of California, San Diego, Professor Fung, actually coined that term, tissue engineering. Professor Fung is the one with the red tie. And he is uh, uh, very dear to me. He's now 92 years old, uh, doing very well. But uh, really a father of biomechanics. And uh, so the next year, we had a meeting in Lake Tahoe and a book combined with a biologist, uh, Fred Fox, and uh, with Dr. Scalac, who's taking a picture with me there. We did this tissue engineering conference workshop, and we published this book, Stressing on Structure and Function. Only biological substitutes, okay? That was our definition at that, at that time. And then the following year, I organized a meeting on structure and function, saying, biological substitute in the American Society of Mechanical Engineering meeting uh, with my Japanese friend. So we were defining the field of tissue engineering at that time. But of course everything changed after that. Chemical engineering took over and biologists take over. And tissue engineering does not resemble anything that we have defined. There's, the word function disappeared. Okay, everybody was changing genes, everybody was changing growth factors, 
there's actually no function. So they just say, look at the cell, go to the culture room, and figure out that something is changing, synthesis changing, whatever. But there's no engineering, no function. So we actually later on change to functional tissue engineering because we want the function back in tissue engineering. Now what did I do? Well, <clears throat> we start out using growth factors very early because growth factors was available. It was very expensive, about 50,000 US dollars for something like a microgram at that time. So we try some growth factors and do a variety of them, see how they affect the cell cells. And then I also look at stem cell work a little bit. Uh, then after these 10 years of doing this area of work, I still find I was never comfortable because I'm not a biologist. I don't really understand what this is going on. Uh, so I said, okay, maybe I'm, in a, I'm doing the wrong thing because my result doesn't come out that, like, I, like I suspect the in vitro results has nothing to do with the in vivo finding. They're so different. And I said, well, you know, this is just too complicated for a simple engineer like me. So I start thinking about maybe the best place where I should be is in the scaffold. Because that's engineering. I can understand, I can control. And more importantly, <coughs> More importantly, I'm interested in the extracellular matrix bioscans. Okay. Because that has the growth factor cytokine, and then it has the mechanical part of the scaffold. So this is what I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. And the scaffold that I picked was because my friend, Dr. Steve Bedelak, actually, that's his scaffold. And he's in the same institution we, we have many times discussed about. It's called the porcine small intestinal submucosa. Now, why am I so excited about this gap? Well, if you look at submucosa, even though it's about 200 micrometers thick, very thin, it is not a homogeneous structure, okay? The side that face the lumen of the intestine is actually has stratum compactum. It's a very well-packed material. Why? Well, the bacteria cannot go into our body. You know, so it's a barrier. <clears throat> the abdominal side, well, it has to replace itself very quickly. As you know, intestine is very capable of reproducing itself. The abdominal side has all the nice growth factors in there, all kinds of good stuff for tissue growth. So thinking about this as a non-homogeneous 200 micrometers thick material, I want to take advantage of this both mechanical part, the barrier, and the biological part, the growth factors. So what we did was let's say, okay, how does this work? <clears throat> the first study we did was we cut the central cell of the patella tendon. We put two pieces as I had. One piece in the bottom, one piece on the top. The piece in the bottom, we have the luminal side facing the fat pack. Because we don't want the healing tissue adhere with the fat pack. Because in ACL reconstruction, that's one of the problems, the adhesion. And then on the top, I reverse. I put the luminal side facing up, and then I put the albuminal side. So you have a little hole in the middle, the rectangular hole, space is all facing growth factors. So we did that. We find that, you know, the neo tissue formation, you can see on the right panel, the SIS treatment, uh, very, very full tissue up to 12. But if you look at the left side, we don't treat it. It still has concavity. Okay, the tissue growth is slow, much, much slower. What about mechanically? Well, if you stretch it, you'll find out the stiffness and the ultimate low about double with the just two thin layers of epsilon. That's all. And also, we find there's no adhesion or the crystal with using. So we were very encouraged. I said, okay, the message is that SIS, 
you see a bioscaffold, can grow more tissues. Can grow more tissues. So the second study we did was, what happened if we <coughs> cut a segment of the MCL of the, of the, of the uh, rabbit? Six millimeter, which is quite big for rabbit. And all I did was put one layer of SI on, the, on it. That's it. And we find out that because of the SIS, the MCL heal, but without hypertrophy. Your natural MCL healing always has hypertrophy. That's how we do it. The body will make a lot of bad tissues, more and more to satisfy the function, but they are not good tissues. My goal is to see if you say, this is the room you can grow, you cannot grow periphery. What happened? Well, it turns out the body, because you restrict the proliferation <coughs> hypertrophy, it makes better tissue for you. And you can see we have never been able to make larger collagen fibrils. And we actually developed larger fibrils under transmission electron microscopy. And that's because we also find that type 5 collagen is reduced. Type 5 collagen sits in between type 1 collagen prevent them from being aggregated. So always small fibrils, not so good properly. But if you can let them aggregate in the larger fibrils, they become better mechanically. And if you look at a modulus, this is a quality of tissue measurement, you can see that it really is improved, going from purple or magenta to blue. Okay, so you, we can actually make better <coughs> tissue with just a simple layer of SIS. So the message is that not only we can make more tissue, but we can also grow better tissue. So after these two studies, I have some confidence that I want to go to look at what happened. What can I do with ACL? <coughs> just about that time, <coughs> May I have some water? Is there some water? Uh, just about that time, <clears throat> my, my dear friend Dr. Stedman have actually published uh, some paper that uh, uh, on encouraging uh, <laughs> on encouraging uh, tissue healing. Ah. That's, that's it. So he published a paper. He was very interested. He said, there's some patient of his <coughs> that tear the ACL. Really, they are not professional soccer players. They just want to have some pitcher size life, but not want to have ACL reconstruction. So what they did was he what he did was he went in to create some especially for proximal femoral tear. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you. For proximal tears, <coughs> he uh, creates a microfracture hole, introduce some blood, grow factors, if you will, and then form a hematoma near the insertion. He thinks that bring in some reparative cells. And then he actually tried on 40, about 200 patients that are 40 years and older. And he find that 92% had reduced pain, 94% had actually pretty normal function, and they all ski because they live around Bay of Area. So actually Basad, a, a few years ago from Turkey, also tried to do the same and report similar results. So, and also at that time, uh, many people are thinking about healing the ACL. So they start out with central defect, make a hole in the ACL, what happened. My colleagues in San Diego, we first tried hyaluronic acid. We find that you can make a little more film. And then growth factors by Kobayashi, and then platelet rich plasma, of course, by Martha Murray, you're all familiar with her work, that, that came actually generate some growth if you poke a hole in the ACL. Then uh, they show some vascularity, more tissue formation, and improved mechanical 
property a little bit. Then Mary's group start doing a complete ACL tear, complete ACL transaction using the foresight model. By that time, she realized she had to use some collagen PRP uh, and primary repair of the injured site. And she gets some healing to take place. But if you can see the healing on the right panel, the ACL heal with tremendous hypertrophy, sometimes even as big as the joint. So lots and lots of tissue. But I always tell people that if you have lots and lots of tissue, it's a bad tissue. We can heal things, but it's proliferation of the bad tissue. It's really not ligament. A lot of type 3 collagen, a lot of scars material. But it healed. So that was encouraging. So, and then the stiffness didn't really increase with time. Four, six, twelve weeks, her data showed basically not much to do. And of course, they're far from normal ACL. So for us, we thought, well, I want the ACL to heal, but I also do not want hypertrophy. I, I based on our previous study. So just at that time we also developed that we can make the SIS in hydrogel. Now, hydro jobs are good because you can inject, you can immediately, they can release flow factors. So, we want to put ECM hydro gel to initiate a faster healing. And then the, on the other aspect, I still use ECM. And I look at the abnormal side to heal the ACL, increase tissue. And then luminal side, I want to protect prevent the ACL from hypertrophy, as well as protect it against the synovial flu. Okay, so what do I do? We hope that they will work in synergy, and then we'll have a successful ACL. So that's what our hypothesis. So what we did was we transect the ACL in the goat, and we do a primary repair like the old days, people repair, pulled it together. And then I use a sheet of SI, just one sheet of SI, with the luminal side facing inside, the luminal side barrier outside. And it's so flimsy, I cannot deliver it, so I use some collagen gel foam to at least I can wrap it around the injured side. And then we did the injection of the hydrogel in the wound side. So this is the model that we use in a goat knee. Sure enough, if you look at 12 weeks later, we have a very good looking healing ACL. Continuity is restored. The cross-sectional area is not significant different from the normal ACL. But this is what we want. Then if you look at histology, the fibers are aligned. The fibroblasts are aligned, although the collagen fiber is not dense like normal ACL, but this, you know, the architecture is correct. And then what pleases me the most is that I see a layer of synovia. So now my healing ACL is protected. The synovial fluid cannot attack it. And mechanically, we find the stiffness is about a half of the normal ACL. And if you just do a control suture repair, nothing is about two and a half <coughs> times higher than that. And it's comparable to our historical data in the laboratory doing gold ACL reconstruction. And looking at the ultimate low, it's about two and a half times of the repair. And it's also comparable to ACL so we have pretty good success with this treatment approach. What do we do? We accelerate the healing. We limit excessive cross-sectional area. Structural property is pretty good. Collagen is aligned and synovium is dead. So we're pretty happy about this. And we are looking into what happened, tissue remodeling, and maybe additional things we could do to make it a functional piece. But the interesting thing is that 
if the goat at 12 weeks they heal, you tensile test it. It always fails when you cut it. Okay, 12 weeks. What happens 26 weeks? Well, you can see by 26 weeks the collagen is pretty dense now. It remodeled into a pretty good looking ligament. But it always fail at the femoral attachment. It doesn't it didn't fail where you, you cut the ACL. Okay. So the ACL is improved, but the attachment is the weakest site now. Why? Well, what happened is that what happened is the weakest link is because during the healing process, we don't use the ACL so much. And the insertion site is a little bit like immobilization. You start deteriorating. So that becomes the weakest, weakest link. So my message here is very important because when we treat ligament injury, even though the ligament could look very nice, but the attachment is something you need to worry about. You get to think about it from the insertion, the origin to the insertion, the whole chain. A lot of time we only look at one side. The ligament that looks good, but the insertion side. If they're not good, it's not working. <coughs> so we said <coughs> mechanical. We recognize the biological augmentation is working, but it's very slow. So what happened? You don't want the knee to be damaged at the same time. So we want to have some mechanical support while these biological things work. So we want to stabilize the knee joint. <coughs> Did a couple of studies using sutures. And we find that there are places you can put a pretty good suture to stabilize the knee a little bit. Not perfect, but a little bit. And then we demonstrate that it functions better than primary repair. Did an in vivo study by putting the sutures across to the medial part of the tibial insertion and anterior part of the femoral. Of course, it's best put right through the ligament. Both. It's good ligament. We don't want to put your sutures through there. We find pretty good interesting. We did a study, a minimal repair. We find that actually with suture augmentation, you can also heal the ACL. This is without biology, just suture augmentation. Now, it's not as good as biological, but it does, it works. It heals better than simple suture repair. And so what we're doing now is that on the inner laboratory, we want to do longer term studies, obviously, to see what's going on. We, we see the initial knee stability is good. We want to see even the scaffold, can we make the scaffold a little better? Like, you know, add some cell to it, stretch it ex vivo, and make it more aligned before we put it in. And uh, of course, there are ways now to sustain release growth factors. Growth factors, they go too fast. I would like to see if we can keep it going using drug delivery systems. And then, of course, now I'm having some student look at the mechanism. Why is it working? Because all we do is apply, but we don't know why it's working. And one area we develop is uh, with, we have a company that they have genetically altered the pig. Because SIS is, you may or may not know that in the shoulder has a very bad reputation because it has inflammatory response. So people are giving, say, oh, SIS is. So we create a uh, alpha gal deficient pig because they, they want to use the pig as transplant, like heart transplant and other things. We want the transplant SIS using for ligaments and tendons. And it really took off almost all the alpha gal, which is the biggest cause for immunogenicity in human application. And one of the things we're doing, we're very excited about, is a called biodegradable metallic material. Now, my suture 
mechanical augmentation is fine. But wouldn't it be better if I can just load the ACL right away? You know? So I'm thinking about a metallic implant that make a scaffold in addition to the ECM scaffold. I want to load my ACL from day one. So just do have we changed clinical edit and paradigm? This is a question mark, right? But there are some study now people are very interested in using uh, bone marrow plasma for partial ACL tests. And of course, our famous Dr. Kuga using ACL reconstruction, uh, PRGF. And of course, there are also controversy in this area. People don't always agree in, in the outcome by using MRI. PRP, as you know, is a very, very hot topic. It's using for almost everything now, uh, bone, meniscus, muscles, cartilage, and reduced knee pain. And I was joking about PRP for hair growth, but I understand last night at dinner, Anna is actually using that and it good success. So it's no longer a question mark. It should be an exclamation point. <clears throat> so for Yet, for the rest of my career, this is what I'm thinking to do. Uh, I'm very excited about porous magnesium. As you know, we need about 350 milligrams of magnesium every day. Now, that's what you take in a supplement. Magnesium can be made with alloy, and it is degradable and resolvable in the body. And we can alloy it, and it can make it any porosity you like. I'm now making a little ring of the piece. And I can just put it on the injured ACL and wrap the SIS over it. Okay. What, the, what happened? Make these a good stick. So the ACL can be loaded right away. So I, want, I don't want the insertion site to deteriorate by not loading it. With a ring like that, I can load it right away. Immediate loading, <clears throat> and then use it with ECM scaffold, and then sustaining with degrowth. This is something that we're thinking about doing. And I'm, I have good success with some magnesium ring now. I have already made that with my colleagues. We have a big uh, NS, NSF grant for 10 years to study at this biodegradable, bioresorbable magnesium oxide. It's actually a very hot topic now. If you haven't heard, you should get interested. <coughs> because porous magnesium, magnesium alloy <coughs> is very, very hot. I think you, it's now the literature citation is taking off like exponentially, where stainless steel citation is flat. And I think we can then decide program it to degrade after the ACL. Once we have sufficient ACL healing to take place, we want the magnesium to degrade. You can program it by coding, by anodizing, and then let the ACL take over. So it's a crossover thing. So we think with this kind of novel functional tissue engineering system, we have done some work on the rabbit, we've done some work in the goat, and we want to eventually move on to human. And Raphael is playing, Raphael is not playing. Djokovic, and I hope she's doing okay. <clears throat> so combined biological and mechanical augmentation, but really the problem we have is how do we evaluate? <clears throat> we don't have a very good evaluation system on ACL function clinically today. I think all the IKDC, all these things, I really don't believe because the, most of these are developed for diagnostic of ACL deficiency. It was not developed for function of the ACL. So I think what we really want to do is to think about a better in vivo assessment by what we call <coughs> getting the real 3D data of the knee motion, femur versus tibia. And system like this by planar fluoroscopy is a way to go. 
we can record images, we can really look at joint kinematics. <coughs> we don't compare this study of somebody like, look, have a little bit of LSD. Uh, you think that this lady is going to have ACL injury. But when we look at motion analysis on the right versus biplane philosophy, with biplane philosophy, we find that her knee kinematic is quite good. But you would suspect, oh, this lady looks valves, we gotta go train. It's not the body adjusted very, very well. So we have more accurate data of what how the tibia really move against female. We are talking about accuracy about 0.1 millimeter, 0.2 millimeter, and 0.1 degree rotation. And it's not possible with motion in a capture system. We have to go to this system. So about 12, 13 years ago, I created this diagram. And I think we, in the last 12 years, we have done many things that happen. We can now get good kinematic data in people. And I can take this kinematic data repeated on my high pay level robotic system. And I can look at what's the ACL function during this in vivo activity, not just could have a knee looking at the interior rotator, but I can look at in vivo activity, what are the forces in the ACL. And the other part is that we have created mathematical models. We can model the knee. We can also calculate the forces in ACL with the kinematic data. Then the model must be validated. They have to check against the experiment. And if they're not, you have to repeat the improvement. And if you do have a model, then you have a lot of possibilities because it's easy to do computer models. You can generate database, gender difference, even you look at the stress-strain relationship in the ACL, how does it work? We look at progress on ACL healing with this model. We look at injury prevention using model. And all these things, I think, we can really eventually improve the patient outcome. And of course, it's not going to happen at once. It's going to be many cycles. But we can always use the model to do that, because experiments are very, very tough to do. So today, I tell you a lot of things in a hurry in the last hour. But really, when you think about it, it's really all these people that I have the opportunity to work with in my life. I've been academics for 43 years, and a lot of people have been working with me. And everyone make contribution in their own way. And so that I can share with you all the data, all the philosophy, all the information that we have. So they're the ones that really deserve the credit. I'm just the spokesman. So with that, I want to thank you very much. And uh, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Thank you.